Today's youth need teachers, volunteers, and most of all, well, they need you. I'm Doug Edwards, and I'm going to be talking with real youth mentors and students to give you the knowledge you need to be the best youth worker possible. This is Youth Worker on Fire. Certain things happen in life. In fact, uh, I just saw a movie, Top Gun Maverick, and it brought thoughts about different things in life. And one thing is this. In this great movie, Top Gun Maverick, I'd seen the first one years ago when, when it came out, and it's been a lot of years later, and they're waiting for the right technology and all of that. But the first movie was shrouded in... There were people who had died. Maverick's wingman or his uh, the second guy, the second guy in the plane, Goose, died in the first movie. By the second movie, the wife of Goose had died. His son was a pilot, et cetera, et cetera. And then the guy that was competing with him, Ice Man, who was an admiral at this point, he ends up dying. Uh, so you, you got things shrouded in death. They're having to deal with these things, these grief, and yet having to go on with life and go on with missions in spite of their feelings and of the mourning that they were feeling through all of those losses. And as I like to tell my, my wife, it's a love story. It's a love story. When she doesn't want to watch something, she probably wants to watch this one. But it made me think of the death and dying of students that my wife, Colleen, and I have had to deal with in our communities. When I went to her house on her birthday to ask her to marry me, and that's a long story. It's not as quaint and pretty and peaceful as you would think it would be. That's a story for another day. I had to go to Orlando that night. We were in South Lake County, and I had asked her to marry me and wishing her a happy birthday. And she was the only person in that area that knew where I was going to be. And so I was in Orlando with my buddy, Andy McDaniel. I was going to spend the night there because the meeting was early the next morning. And so I was there and about 1 a.m. I get a call from Colleen. She said, you've got to go to Ocala. Michael is in a coma. Something happened and they need you up there. So I left and I drove to Ocala, the hospital there, and Michael was a guy that was like the who's who on campus. He was a senior that year. Some things had happened that summer, and he went through a lot of soul searching, asked Jesus into his heart. Now, I wasn't a part of that. Actually, his youth worker, Jim, Jim Cornell, was a part of that. I know Jim wouldn't mind me mentioning his name, so I'll say Jim. But I was his campus life director. So after the fact, all this, he started going to campus life, started bringing a lot of students. You could see the amazing attitude the guy had had. I'd already been there a few years, and you could see a major change in his life. But I'd seen Michael that Friday morning. I would try to go to campus often, and sometimes I would go before school started. And this was uh, in the parking lot. Uh, as students were leaving the cars and going into campus. And I saw Michael and I said, uh, hey, how you doing? And we kind of started a conversation. But I noticed that he was not his same perky, happy self. Now, here's a guy that everybody at the school loves him. He is just loved by his family. I mean, he's the guy. He's the guy on campus. They expect him to go to state in football because of his leadership ability, his quarterback abilities, and all of this was amazing. And I said, Michael, are you okay? And he said, yeah. He said, I'm just I'm feeling a little bit down right now. And so I walked him to class, said hi to a few other students, and I left. And then that night, all of those things happened. I got a call. So I went to the hospital in Ocala, 
the students, of course, were there from the football game because at halftime, he came off the field after playing the first half and he collapsed and he never woke up again. He was in a coma at this point. He had had an aneurysm. And one of the moms was a nurse. In fact, she was the head of nursing at a local college in our area. And she talked to me. She said, Doug, it doesn't look good. People just don't, short of God doing something, people don't recover from this. And so his parents were there. The student body, probably a good portion of the student body was there because it was just devastating to them. I don't know if they called the game. I don't know what happened because it was one of the few games, football games that I did not go to. And so I would pray over Michael. We prayed with other students. His youth pastor, Jim, was up there as well. His parents were there. His coaches were there. It was just not a good moment. And later they pronounced him dead by the, by the next day. So here we are, our first time we had to deal with a student that had died. And not a student that was unknown, even though no student should die at a young age. No child should die. It's devastating for a student body, but it's more devastating for their parents and their siblings. And he had a younger brother. And the younger brother was much quieter than him. This was just a difficult, hard thing. And why am I telling you about this? Because you're going to deal, if you stay in student ministry long enough and in the same area, you're going to deal with some student dying or some student going through some tragic life-altering event. And you're going to not think you know what to do. You're going to think, well, you know, you're not trained for this. And guess what? I was not trained for this. They did not go through this. We did not talk about the death and dying of students and or their family members because I went through that too, the death and dying of parents of students. But because I was in an area this long, this was the first time something like this had happened. And so went through the funeral. I did not officiate the funeral. I was not his pastor. I was not his youth pastor. I was his campus life director, a community director. But I went through those things. And the one thing that we did not know until after his death was this, that in his zeal and his passion for God and the great forgiveness he felt from God from whatever it was, I don't even know what was happening that summer that drove him to Jesus, but it was something very significant. His other pastors knew, but he shared his relationship with many, many of the students. We came up with a number of about 75 of the students that he had told about Jesus and about Jesus coming into his heart. So we account for those people who came to know Christ during that time to Michael. But you think, though, that's the end of the story, and that's a great story, and because of his relationship with God and sharing Jesus, that everything went well. And the answer is no. People were grieving. In spite of whether or not you went to heaven or not, this is a young man, a senior in high school, a leader in his sport division, a leader in his student body as a whole, a loved, loved person in his church, in his family most of all, and a brother that's left with another brother who's gone. He's left him. He's gone to heaven, but nevertheless, his life's got to be lived without Michael. And so some events happened, and some students, instead of running to God, they started running away from God. We were in a small community and running a campus life program at that time. So anytime we big, did a big event, we had a lot of students, hundreds of students would come out to the event. So we had one weeks later. It was a standard set event that we ran uh, at the beginning of the school year because this was not too far into the school year. And the students had planned another event around our event, which was a drinking party, a bonfire somewhere else. And so they would tell the parents they were coming to our event. And one uh, group of students, one parent said, okay, we're dropping them off. 
Uh, they're in, in your charge, and they literally dropped them off outside the door of where we were having the event. And as they drove off, the students would not go inside yet. We're going to, come on, come on, you got to go inside, come on. A car drove up, and they jumped in the car, and they left because they wanted to go to this party, wanted to hang out with their buddies. They wanted to grieve. They wanted to drink. They wanted to try to smother their feelings and all the emotions that were going on. And I had to call the parents that night. I said, listen, the girls, as soon as you left, I couldn't get a hold of them because it was not as easy as it was now. That was a whole, we knew the party that we're at. We had to call that place. There were no cell phones. It was crazy. So they came and we all went looking for the girls and we found them. Put a damper on their party. So years later, I moved. I'm up at the north end of the county. I had not intended to leave South Lake County, but some circumstances happened, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to follow my trainer, and and he's moving to Miami, so I think I'll move there with him. That didn't work out. Ended up in South Lake County, where I did not realize that I was being prepared for dealing with a lot of student deaths over the next few years. Students I knew, students that were part of our program. And it seemed like it was at least once and sometimes twice a year that we would have a death. One death in a decade of a student is way too much. One death a year is like mind-blowing and just destructive. And this, uh, it, it wasn't quite a year after a while, but there were some very crazy deaths uh, that that happened over the next 15 or so years. But what I learned from, from Michael's death and later the deaths of these other students was this. You are not trained. In fact, if you can go get some training, that is amazing. But here's one thing I'll tell you. If someone dies, if a student dies, and they're at the hospital and you hear about it, immediately go. Don't wait to be asked just show up. This came from a guy by the name of Jack Larson, who was in student missions, and he created missions, short-term missions uh, in different places in the world for students to go out of the country. And he came up with a sermon that to the years and decades later, we still remember his words, that the most important thing what we can do when there's a tragedy happening or if someone is hurting is to just show up. Just like when we tell people to let the Holy Spirit be your teacher, the Holy Spirit will guide you. And what I pray is, Lord, your words in my mouth, which is out of Isaiah, give those to me so that I say the right things, and most of all, help me to keep my mouth shut. There's seldom any words and usually no words that you can use to heal or to help someone go through this kind of grief. The biggest thing you can do is be there with them. Pray for them and be careful with your prayers, but to love on them and to let you know because you're representing the God of the universe to many people, to any person that you show up with there. There are times that I would have parents almost collapse and or a big smile in spite of the tragedy come on my on their face when I would show up when their kid was in the hospital after a wreck or if there after a death that they felt comfort that the person who had spoke spiritual words into their children's lives was there with them in their biggest grief. And so just show up, number one. Number two, ask the right questions. Ask them. How can I help you? And then keep your mouth closed and hear what they say. But know this, if you'll just show up, if you'll pray those prayers, Lord, your words in my mouth, Lord, show me how to minister to these people. Those prayers will go a long way. And if you'll just be there to comfort them and and care about them, And don't stay longer than you need to stay. Stay as long as you should stay. And that is a discernment thing. And read the room. Make sure you're aware of what's what. A suicide is different than a child dying of an aneurysm. A car wreck 
is different than a suicide. All kinds of different ways that that people die in this life. And I don't like to be on this negative thing of this is death. They're, we're ushering these people to the throne room of God, to heaven, where their children are going to be. You need to read everything you can on heaven, but don't blurt that out. No one wants to know about heaven or very little at that time, but they do want comfort. Remember Mary and Martha, Lazarus dies. Jesus shows up days late. Now, he's Jesus. Remember that. He's Jesus. He knows he's going to do this thing. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Unless God's told you that, you don't know that. And so he showed up late, and they just said to him, if only you were here. And he saw their grief, and the shortest verse in the Bible is written there. And the words are, Jesus wept. And we read that, and it's kind of trite, and you kind of go, okay, I read that. Jesus wept. Okay, he cried a little bit. I would not doubt if Jesus wailed in weeping because that's part of the culture. But I believe he was overcome with grief for Mary and Martha, even though he knew what he was going to do. Because to them, Lazarus, their brother, was gone. He's dead. He's out. And Jesus could have saved him before he got to death. So they were already in grief and in that grieving process and a little disappointed that Jesus didn't show up, maybe a lot disappointed, and he knew that. And then you know the rest of the story, if you've read the story, and Lazarus was raised from the dead. But you're not necessarily in that situation. If you can be, you've got God's given you that ability and power that kind of faith, good for you. I never dismiss that kind of faith in people's lives. It's happened, and it's happened in this generation. But I will say, grieve with those who grieve. That's what Proverbs tells us. Mourn with those who mourn. Ecclesiastes says there's a season, there's a time for every season. There's a time that things are going to happen. There's a season for grief. and so. Love your people. Realize things are going to hit you sideways and that you're going to go through them. But realize on the other side, there's still going to be good things happening. Death is not going to be as prominent unless you're in some war zone as life is. There are more people living in the United States than there are dying. You're going to deal with more people living than dying. Be happy about that. I finally started praying the prayer, Lord, no more dead students. Not in my community, no more dead students. And it was like for years, it stopped. And there was no more people that we were burying. So just remember this. God is above all things. You need to show up and let him show off for you and be willing to comfort people without overstepping your boundaries and do a little bit of learning on it because God is there. He already knows what's happening. Psalm 139 says he knows that our days are numbered. He knows them, every one. Psalm 139 is a great comfort. All right, Youth Worker Nation, have a great day. Maybe you need to go watch a movie or two. We'll see you later. You've been listening to the Youth Worker on Fire podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and tell your friends. Also, leave a comment and tell us what you think. Stay tuned for more informative episodes.